Okay, so that was perspective number one. Uh, we're going to shift to our second perspective on water issues with uh, Ms. Amanda Brock. She is the CEO and founder of Water Standard. They are a water treatment company, a global water treatment company that serves the oil and gas industry. Uh, she's been named one of the top 10 women in energy by the Houston Chronicle. She was invited this year to the White House for part of the, their announcement related to uh, the Moonshot for Water initiative. And she led uh, a White House delegation to Abu Dhabi in April to view uh, desalinization facilities there. She's a board member of the Heart Research Institute uh, for Gulf of Mexico Studies, uh, on the advisory board of the Texas Executive Women, and a columnist writing for Water Energy Nexus uh, for, uh, excuse me, Water Energy Nexus for the Global Water Intelligence. And she uh, earned her undergraduate degree in South Africa and her law degree from LSU. Is there an appropriate hoot or something we're supposed to do for LSU? <laughs> Uh, and so please, with that, please welcome uh, Ms. Brock. Thank you very much for inviting me tonight. I guess with the LSU part of it, um, I should be wearing purple. Um, that was a big, or, or gold, that's correct. Um, that was a big change for me when I came from Africa. Um, Baton Rouge and LSU was my first stop in the United States. Um, we apparently spoke the same language and apparently there wasn't a culture shock. But, um, so Jonathan and I, our paths crossed. There was a small cadre of people around the world who deal with global issues um, and talk a lot about the future of water and what's happening. Um, so Jonathan sort of set the stage, and I'm going to actually go over some of the points that he made as well, um, but go over them quickly and then sort of talk more about facts. Because I think one of the things that we deal with in water, particularly when we deal with the politics of water, and everybody has such a tremendous opinion depending on the silo they come from, facts tend to be obscured. And I think the very important thing is in an audience like this who, MIT, therefore we like facts, is science-based um, decision-making and focusing on what is really happening out there. Bottom line, we are the apex consumers. And you just look at some of those pictures, and this is in a developed nation, and you think about all the developing nations, and the fact is that we want more of everything. And the problem is they're more of us. And Jonathan mentioned that nine billion What's really startling is the speed at which we are procreating and the speed at which populations are increasing. And you just realize that notwithstanding technology and advances in every other sector, we are on a collision course with ourselves. And when then you then deal with the issue of climate change and you deal with the politics and the geopolitics of just security and water being such a, um, a lightning um, point for people when they're considering all of the decisions they make, you realize this is just not sustainable. And when you focus on the fact that the water food energy nexus is about the most important nexus we can think about, and that interconnectedness comes back to water, because without water, we die. That's real simple. And so we can solve the population problem by screwing up the water equation. I mean, I'm kind of being a little bit flippant, but um, you know, in the words of John Beddington, um, chief economist in the UK, about two years ago, he talked about the perfect storm. And that may be a cliche, but if you look at what he was looking at and talking about in 2030, the world is going to need to produce about 50% more food and energy to just deal with population growth. And in addition, we're going to have to find 30% more fresh water. Well, all of us know about the water cycle. You can't just find more fresh water unless you make more fresh water. And maybe making fresh water has its own political baggage when you start talking about desalination. 1.8 billion people will live 
in an area and region of absolute water scarcity. That's a frightening number. And with climate change accelerating this, we aren't finding a way out of that. People are going to live in areas of stress condition, and that is both physical and economic. Two years ago, three years ago now, I listened to the GE chief economist talk about the fact that water, the lack thereof, or not being located where people needed it to be located, was the single biggest threat and constraint to US economic growth. The UN Security Council now talks about water in terms of an agenda item they have to follow. The US Defense Force has also indicated that one of the top five threats, and they have it as number three, is water. Shared watershed, people competing for a finite resource. Texas faces the same challenge. I mean, we fight with Mexico with the water allocations across the Rio Grande. We fight with our neighbors. Whose water is it anyway? And we have to think about the fact that you only get water in certain places. Traditional sources, those are the rivers. That's rain. That's the aquifer. Conservation. We can get more water, not really, but we can spread it further by conserving it. But that has limited elasticity. Reuse. This toilet to tap concept. We're the only country that doesn't like to use that term, toilet to tap. Somehow it just you know, creates a, a shudder in a lot of people, a visceral reaction. But reuse doesn't have to mean toilet to tap. It means reusing water in industry, using water in other areas. And then desalination. The only drought proof source of water we have is desalination. It is also water we make, so it hasn't been previously allocated so it truly is a new source. One of our problems is pollution. So even when we deal with finite fresh water, it's not so finite. Because in some areas, we pollute the water so badly that we do not have adequate technology or it is not cost effective to clean that water to the point that it can be reused and therefore it is disposed of, usually deep well injection. And we can come to that as well in the energy industry with saltwater disposal wells. But there is some good news in certain places. The trend, education, pollution, you see that around the world where you expect increased levels, you see them, China, increased industrialization. And then, of course, where you see the fact that here in the US and most places, we are doing a better job in dealing with pollution. Why? because fines, regulation, environmental stewardship, and people really are focusing on it. We're all impacted by it. So let's get to the headline. I can't stand behind these headlines as facts. I'm just going to announce them as headlines. Texas waterways are the nation's fourth most polluted. That was Texas Monthly in 13. Texas is the second biggest water polluter in the country, but when you consider the toxins in that water, apparently we are by far the worst polluter. Regardless of whether these numbers are correct, directionally they are, and they impact us, so of course we being at the apex, very self-centered, put the human there, but it's not only the human, it's the environment, it's how we live, it's our future. But let's look at global water demand quickly and run through a couple of other things. Global fresh water, what is the biggest user? Agriculture. And if you look then at the industrial sector, 22% household drinking water and ag, ag by far outweighs water use globally. If we look at the US water demand, and there's one thing that we need to keep in mind. There's this concept of consumptive use. And that is when you use it and you don't use it again. And this trips up a lot of people. A lot of people talk about the energy industry, or let's say the power industry, as this massive user. Yes, but it reuses that same water over and over again. So if we look at this slide, it tells us that thermoelectric power irrigation, public supply was 90%. And of that, it shows thermal electric being the highest, but in fact, it withdraws it 
but it reuses it. So we need to really focus on that consumptive use pattern when we focus on where can we find better ways of using the water we have. Good news here, and it's talked about, is that withdrawals are going down. So we've got a population increase, but we actually are beginning to use less of water in certain areas. Efficiency, conservation. Just an aside, in Germany last year, their education efforts, they had got to the point that they were conserving so much water. And you don't think about Germany as you know, really having a big problem with water and access to water. But they were beginning to conserve so much water that not only were their utilities having financial difficulty because they weren't selling much, but their water table had risen to an unhealthy level. So they were actually asking people, please use more water. So you never know what you get when you, you start going down a path. But I can assure you here in this state, that won't happen. So US population increasing, water use decreasing. Trends, this slide to really show that if you look at this trend, you will see that thermoelectric power use is coming down, irrigation is coming down. Everything else is staying fairly steady, including domestic public supply, which means we are using less water. We still use an astonishing amount that I, in the US that I'll show you in a, in a second. Texas demand, irrigation. Irrigation topped our largest water consumption because when we make, well, we grow cotton, and when we sell that cotton and it becomes something else and it leaves, that is consumption. Another little aside. Saudi Arabia outlawed the use of water for wheat. They were no longer going to use water for wheat. They were going to import all their wheat. That water was going to be used elsewhere. Where? In basic water injection in the oil fields. OK? I get it. So I'm going to import wheat, and I'm going to create, I'm going to be able to generate more um, from my oil fields. Guess who's the largest exporter of wheat, therefore of water, to Saudi? We are. This is the connectedness of the world we live in. And sometimes you should ask, should we be growing wheat in the places we're growing it? But irrigation is coming down in the state, and everything else is staying fairly steady. I'm going to go straight after that. Facts. World capita, that includes Africa, that includes developing nations, about 40 gallons a day. When we lay on our pools, washing our cars, watering our lawns. It's astonishing how much water we use. It's also astonishing the agendas. And we talk about electric generation. We talk about coal. And coal is bad. It uses a lot of water. Well, let's just say coal is bad, but maybe it doesn't use as much water as we think it does. It's got other issues. If you look then at what we do when we are just outdoor watering in comparison per capita basis, or we take a shower, or to my husband, who's in the audience for the first time, actually, he never hears me speak, I'm usually not in this country, um, that shower that keeps running when you get distracted <laughs> and you've already got it on, you're, you're part of this problem, honey. <laughs> but if we look at our basic kitchen and bathroom, and that's not the long shower. That's basic, you're cleaning yourself. It's 100 to 140 gallons. And then it's all this other stuff we do. And you've got to think about it. We water our lawns and we wash our cars with the same stuff we brush our teeth. That is crazy. Smart people out there better find a solution because we can't sustain that. Quickly, this is my deal. The oil and gas industry. If you listen to the press, and if you looked at the headlines, you would think that the oil and gas industry was using more water and was doing more damage to the water supply than any other sector. That is just not the case. And so let's just look at a couple of facts, and not just because we're in Texas and not because of the Permian and because of shales, but hydraulic fracturing, fracking, has got a very bad name, Gasland. 
all of the hysteria that came from that documentary that has been discredited. That methane, the gas that lit up underneath the tap was naturally occurring, but that gets lost. So if we look at the oil and gas industry, a couple of things, and I am going to go bullet by bullet here. So if we use 400 billion gallons of water every day, that is one whole lot of water. Agriculture, 80% of consumptive use. In 2010, the Texas Water Development Board estimated that total municipal losses for leakage was 225 billion gallons, and that was only with 40, sorry, 52%, I was going backwards, 52% of the cities responding. Duke University just did this great study, fact-based. In nine years, hydraulic fracturing used 250 billion gallons of water. So in nine years, hydraulic fracturing used less than one day of the overall US use, slightly more than one year of what we waste in our pipes through leakage, and what, less than 1% of industrial use. And you don't want to get into the politics of, is it better to farm or frack? But let's just focus on the economics, the unit of water used in hydraulic fracturing is a whole lot better than that unit of water used on corn for ethanol. Don't get me started on that one. <laughs> so those are facts. UT, great report, a little bit dated now. 2013 actually happens to be dated. But the problem is that in serious drought conditions, we don't have enough water to go around. And if we don't have enough water to go around, who gets to be curtailed? Who gets to be the whipping boy? Who gets to be the bad user if there's not enough water to go around? At the end of the day, Texas is estimated to use by 2020 less than 0.6% for hydraulic fracturing. The energy industry is looking for alternatives. They are recycling, they are reusing, they are looking at brackish water, but more importantly, if I go back, the Duke University study found that at the same time as they were using water, they generated 210 billion gallons of produced water or wastewater. So that produced water is now becoming a water source. It is being reinjected, it is being reused. That is new water. So when we talk about desalination, actually there's another water source water we hadn't accessed before that is being accessed in, by the oil and gas industry and we talk, we talk about it as produced water. And the technology is there to clean it up. Two drinking water standards. It's costly, so it's not cost effective, but it can be done. Actually, um, the biggest study that was done and is being implemented was in Colombia, um, where they are now irrigating palm oil trees not for human consumption, but for other uses, but the Pacific Rubialis project is where they were doing it. So if we go on the new sources of water, desalination has to be considered, produced water becomes a source, and in conclusion here, we have to get out of our own way. We have to look at this, price water as it needs to be priced. We need leadership and actionable plans. We need fact-based decision-making, and the consequences of not having water or adequate access to it are far outweighed. We have to ensure that future supply. Most importantly, we've got to get the elephants out the room and ask the hard questions. Thank you very much.